The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, thanks for tuning in today. Uh, I want to thank NutriWest for uh, sponsoring this webinar, and we've got a good one today. Uh, my name is uh, Brandon Lundell, and I've uh, put together uh, uh, what I feel is, is a very important topic that I don't feel, uh, well, I, I do feel that it doesn't get enough uh, uh, time, and, and, and uh, given its uh, importance uh, today, uh, my goal is to just really increase the awareness of this topic. So we're going to talk about fetal epigenetics, how early life environment uh, inputs program lifelong changes. So what we're really talking about uh, today is how the in utero and how the preconception and postnatal environment programs the offspring for lifelong changes, changes that, that in some cases are permanent. And how to implement some very simple uh, things that you can do uh, for mothers and fathers uh, to be that can make uh, big big changes and big differences. So, so uh, disclaimer, standard disclaimer, statements in this presentation have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, so I'm going to try to keep it as politically correct as possible. These statements do not necessarily represent NutriWest. These are kind of my statements. They're just sponsoring me. And uh, and of course, it's always the listener's responsibility to take this information and apply it. We're certainly not saying that uh, any of this information can treat, cure, or prevent disease. All right, now that we've got that, there is no greater influence on the health or well-being or the potential for disease or dysfunction of an individual's life than the environment within which that very life began. And that is something that's very important. We all know it instinctively. It's not. It's nothing new. But like I said, I. I think it deserves more emphasis given what we now know as the true uh, beginnings of illness and the true beginnings of, of dysfunction. So the development of a tree depends upon where it is planted. Makes sense. But what we see is that where it is planted, the in utero, the, the maternal environment, even the paternal environment, will last throughout a lifetime. So it's very important to understand how we can make simple changes that can have a positive effect on the offspring, a positive effect on our children. And I've said this before in my other lectures that for everything that parents do to support their child, and every parent, you know, most parents, I mean, they want to give their child the absolute best opportunity in life that they can. They save for college, they put them in good schools, they take time to love them and teach them. However, Given all of that, everything that we do for our children, this, I believe, is perhaps the, the most important in terms of physical and, and, and mental health. For the rest of the child's life, this is a critical window that, that never happens again. And if there's some miscues and some environmental inputs that shouldn't be there, um, then we're going to see some problems develop in childhood and in adulthood. So it's very important. Uh, to understand what those are, and because those become points of therapeutic intervention. So if we want a society where critical uh, measures, you know, critical medicine, I should say, is not the norm, uh, then we have to begin before birth. Uh, the dominoes of dysfunction have already begun to fall. I equate this to truing a compass, if anyone out there is... Uh, you know, a, a, a sailor or anything. Truing the compass means that you know you you make sure. And in 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 flying, we also do this. We 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 true our instruments so that we make sure that it is exactly um, our directional components, our, our our compasses are exactly right on. Because if we're even a quarter of a degree off, then we're going to end up in uh, you know South Africa instead of you know. Morocco. So, um, so that's it's kind of really important. We're truing the compass of our children, and if anything is slightly off, then the chances of them getting dysfunction and 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 disease as they get older is is uh, increased and and very likely. And we call this the two hit theory, where the first hit becomes the in utero environment and changes to the genetics and changes to organ function, and then we, of course, need the postnatal uh, and childhood and adult um, uh, hits of, of 
you know, pollution or stress or you know, nu nutritional deficiencies, that kind of thing. So it's the two-hit theory. But if we take one of those hits away, everyone's focused on the second hit, but we really have missed the piece of this first hit. So if we can remove that first hit, then, then those postnatal influences won't be as destructive. So what is fetal programming? It's the understanding that the developing embryo or fetus is immediately and in some cases irrevocably uh, changed by its surrounding environment. So um, in a way as to program these certain elements. Okay, So um, these can be in many cases permanent changes. So, um, so we'll talk about that. Developmental origins of health and dysfunction, DOHD, it's been around for quite a while. This isn't anything new. I'm certainly uh, not bringing, you know, something completely new and radical to you all today, but it's important to, to really understand it at a deeper level. And the developmental origins of health and dysfunction was, uh, was originally termed by Dr. Barker uh, back in the uh, 80s. He started doing some of this early research, and he found that these epigenetic changes in utero and to a lesser extent postnatal period, what, what is now referred to as the first thousand days, right? So you got the nine months in the womb and then the first two years of life, that, that's known as the first thousand days. And we do see that most uh, adult, you know, your health or lack of, of health is basically programmed in that first thousand days. And it doesn't mean that it's, a, it's your fate to, to, you know, develop disease if things didn't go right in this first 90, you know, these first hundred, you know, thousand days but it means that your propensity and likelihood, it's going to be more important um, to, do, uh, to, to live a healthy lifestyle for, for these people. So um, epigenetic changes in utero and to a lesser extent postnatal changes cause lasting changes to physiologic and metabolic function which persist and predispose offspring to childhood and adult dysfunction. So we're going to, we're going to talk a lot about that today. It's really exciting. Uh, couple of terms I want to introduce you all to, fetal exposome. So the totality, so all of the pieces uh, of endogenous and exogenous cues, so the mother's hormonal cues, the mother's microbiotic cues, the mother's organic acids, all of these things influence fetal development and together we call them uh, the fetal exposome. So, um, and in this uh, study here, uh, the author says, developmental periods in early life may be particularly vulnerable to impacts of environmental exposures. And we're not just talking about, I think, when people see environmental exposures, the first thing they think of is pollutants and toxins. And yes, we are talking about that, but we're also talking about changes to the internal maternal environment. So we're, we're both and talking about endogenous and exogenous uh, environment. Human research on this topic is generally focused on a single hit, right? So uh, let's focus on just a pollutant or let's focus on uh, excess cortisol or let's focus on uh, a specific microbiota in the mother and how does that change. But what we're seeing is that they all come together and of course the sum is greater than that just the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So the exposome concept encompasses the totality of exposures from conception onward and actually preconception. Many of these exposures are, are there in the maternal and paternal environment because of things that that child was exposed to uh, or that mother or father was exposed to in utero. So we're seeing this kind of transgenerational effect. And, I'll get, I'll get more into that later, it makes sense. So what are some of the exogenous? Well, of course, pollutants, car exhaust, chemicals, BPA is one of the most, you know, most studied, that's why it's starting to, to, to be phased out, but of course, it will probably never be completely phased out because once it's released into the environment, it's gonna take hundreds, if not thousands of years, just like we uh, have seen with some of the PCBs that were outlawed in the 60s and 70s, and they're still ubiquitous and persistent in the environment. Of course, heavy metals, that's a bigger issue with the pollution of our, uh, of our um, oceans and uh, increased uh, mercury and, and lead and, 
and all of that. So uh, plastics like BPA, noise, uh, there's some studies that talk about noise and how noise increases the stress response of the mother, which then increases uh, the fetal epigenetics or influences the fetal epigenetics. That child will always have an increased stress response to, to noise and stress if the mother is exposed to these to a certain extent. Of course, diet, we're going to talk about how diet influences the offspring uh, development, uh, UV radiation, secondhand smoke, and then of course endogenous inflammatory cytokines. If the mother is inflamed, and that's one of the biggest points I want to make today, is we have to treat these mothers and fathers to be, you know, before they get pregnant, um, you know, we have to treat the, the things like obesity, things that contribute to inflammation, dysbiosis, infections, not just the the, the traditional infections like, you know, toxoplasmosis and things like that, but even small minor perturbations in, in the gut microbiota have dramatic influences on uh, the, the development of that offspring. Uh, glucocorticoids, sex hormones, uh, leptin, that's where the obesity comes in. Uh, of course, we all know women who are overweight and men too, they secrete more leptin and insulin. Well, those are one of the most damaging uh, um, uh, exposome components and one of the most damaging inputs to to the fetus because <clears> that's <throat> basically programming the fetus for for always having uh, abnormal feeding behavior, um, abnormal adiposity. Thyroid is one of the most important as well. If the mother has even slightly thyroid, and most of you out there probably have uh, treat. Um, thyroid disorders and see a lot of that in your patients. It's on the rise uh, for many different reasons, Nutri you know, iodine deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies, autoimmune, leaky gut. We all, you know, these are all things that destroy the thyroid uh, pollutants, but mothers who have even slight perturbations in thyroid hormone are going to have dramatic effects on the developing fetus, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those today. Neurotransmitters, infectious agents, nutrient deficiencies, uh, diet again, not just the uh, leptin and insulin, but AGE formation, so glucotoxicity. Glucose uh, crosses the placental barrier quite easily, so when you spike your blood sugar, then you're doing irreparable damage to, to uh, not only the genetics, but, but organogenesis, the, the development of the organs of that fetus. So we'll talk about that. And of course, reactive oxygen species, how uh, that, that inf those inflammatory um, um, uh, oxygen species can really do a lot of damage to the developing brain especially. So here's just a, a, another schematic of the, the exposome fetal nutrition stress environmental toxins up here uh, causes these, this reorganization and adaptation. Okay, we call this um, uh, fetal adaptation, and that's what the, the fetus is trying to do. It's trying to adapt for survival. And in many ways, this is a good thing. Uh, this isn't a bad thing. Uh, in many ways, you know, we want the fetus to be able to respond to the current environment. It gives our species a greater chance of survival. It gives that offspring a greater chance of, of dealing with what the postnatal environment is going to be. The problem is, many times, the internal environment, uh, which is macronutrient excess but micronutrient deficient, programs the baby to, uh, to be very efficient. We call this the thrifty gene hypothesis. So it turns on these genes that make the baby want to store fat. It makes the baby want to um, use their calories very efficiently. So the mitochondrial density decreases. And so uh, the baby's born getting ready for this kind of, you know, starvation environment because that's really what's happening in the womb. The child is being starved. Even in the macronutrient excess environment, that causes low oxygen, that causes, you know, increased reactive oxygen species. But then the baby's born into a completely different environment, and that's why we see low birth weight babies, you know, babies being born low birth weight because the fetal environment, because the in utero environment was not optimal. And then what does every pediatrician say? Uh, oh, the child has to gain weight, gain weight, gain weight. You know, the first, the first three months, six months, the child has to gain a lot of weight. And yes, if they're low birth weight, they should gain a little bit of weight. But what we're seeing is that, you know, I always tell uh, my patients who come in, you know, my, my pediatric patients, if they're born low birth weight, which there's different definitions, but if they're born below five and a half pounds, 
then they really need to gain weight kind of slowly. They shouldn't just cross what we call centiles. So you have to be careful about uh, catch-up growth and over catch-up growth. Um, so, so be very, very careful about that. And the same thing if they're born uh, high birth weight. And we're seeing, we used to see this kind of uh, bell-shaped curve of weight distribution for newborns, if you can all picture this. The weight distribution kind of represented a bell curve where most of the people, uh, most of the offspring, most of the children born were kind of in the middle there and, and, and of good weight. But what we're seeing is a flattening out and, in fact, an upside down U curve or an, a U curve now where more kids are being born either low birth weight or high birth weight, which, interestingly enough, both of those have kind of the same detrimental effects that we're seeing. Um, with we all know the statistics we're seeing an increase in childhood and adult disorders the brain disorders right you know I don't we, we have a lot of those we have adiposity we have an increase in asthma increase in allergies so and a lot of this is happening like I said in utero so we these these this, this fetal exposome, this in utero environment, causes cell reorganization. So literally altered cell number, uh, proliferation and size. Uh, and then epigenetic changes, so changes to how the genes function. Now, the genes themselves don't necessarily change, but how they function, which is the definition of epigenetics, changes. And again, these changes can be lifelong. So how the DNA is methylated uh, is, is basically programmed in utero. So it modifies the gene expression for the rest of the child's life in many cases. And then, of course, the whole organ. So the brain, as the brain is developing, developing um, there is a study done. I don't have it in here, but uh, we see that uh, brain changes um, for autism, uh, we can track it to in utero changes, we already start to see certain parts of the cingulate gyrus and 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 the the, the thalamus changing in in uh, in kids with with neurological and developmental delays, uh, and it's due to a lot of these fetal environment uh, inputs. So, and here's adipose tissue. So again, if the mother has excess adipose tissue, that leptin and insulin goes in and programs the baby for. Uh, altered appetite for increased appetite and increased lipogenesis. So very important we can make these changes. Again, this isn't anything dramatically new, but the importance of it is what I want to get across today so that we can increase the uh, dialogue with, with our patients. Uh, I, I want to see this, you know, being talked about more with, with everyone who's uh, thinking about getting pregnant and even anyone who is of reproductive age because I talk about this with, with all of my teenage uh, uh, patients and in their 20s and 30s because half of all pregnancies are unplanned. So they may not be planning on getting pregnant. So they're like, oh, I don't need to listen to this. I, you know, I've got time to lose weight. I, I don't need to take supplements. You know, I don't need to you know, address my health concerns right now. Well, they turn around and get pregnant, and that's, that's a, two problems with that. One, they've got all of these you know, inflammatory cytokines and stress and things going on that's programming the fetus, and they don't even know it. The average time of an unplanned pregnancy uh, to where they know that they're pregnant is five weeks. Well, the neural tube, the, the entire neural tube develops in the first six to eight weeks. So you're talking about, you know, 80 percent, 90 percent uh, of the neural tube of that child's already developed when they're doing things like, well, one, not taking enough uh, uh, nutrients like folic acid, methylfolate, or they're in engaging in risky behaviors. You know, uh, they're smoking or they're drinking or they're you know being in a stressful environment. So, so it's really important to know to to get this information out that what parents do before they get pregnant has the greatest, in my opinion, impact on the child's health for its entire life. So. Very important. Now, here's a great study: mechanisms of non-genetic inheritance and psychiatric disorders. So, what this study is, why I like the study, is it, it 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 highlights the importance of not genetics. These these things are not uh, many of of who we are, our phenotype, right? Uh, who, what we're expressing, our our traits, our inherited traits, quote unquote inherited traits, are not genetically derived but epigenetically derived so that's 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 what non-genetic means it's not the 
the genes that you inherit, but it's how those genes actually function, which is epigenetic. So, so his term here, this author's term here is non-genetic, but what we're really saying is mechanisms of epigenetic inheritance in psychiatric disorders. So what, what they did, uh, well, I thought this is just a great design, uh, proof of concept study, if you will. Uh, so this wild type mouse, Wild type mice uh, are not prone to anxiety, whereas the KO, the knockout mice, they knocked out the this mouse, the black mouse here. They knocked out the black mouse uh, uh, a serotonin receptor, so that they were prone to anxiety. Okay, so what they did was they took um, the the uh, wild type uh, fetus. Okay, so all of these uh, mice that we're going to talk about are are for, of wild type genetic origin. So they don't have the knockout, uh, they're not missing the serotonin receptor, okay? So none of them, if it was just genetic, none of them should be prone to anxiety. Well, what they did is they put this wild type um, uh, uh, fetus into a knockout mouse. So so the, the, the offspring is being brought to full term, being gestated inside the womb of a stressed out mouse basically and then that mouse is um, weaned by the wild type so it's kind of uh, discerning well is it the prenatal environment is it the in utero environment or is it the postnatal environment well what do we expect to see um, was very different what what we saw what they saw was that the offspring exposed to the prenatal knockout environment develop these anxious tendencies, even though, one, it doesn't have the gene for it, and two, it was weaned by, a, you know, a calm, caring mother, <laughs> so to speak. So we see here that it was the in utero environment that that pre-programmed the offspring to lifelong anxiety. This was, this was a lifelong, and in subsequent studies, this mouse actually passed on that trait to its uh, offspring as well, even though it is a wild type um, um, uh, genetic uh, in origin. Now then we uh, they did uh, the wild type and they transplanted it into another wild type mother and uh, it was weaned by a stressed out mother, uh, a knockout mother, but the child or the offspring actually was not anxious. It did not. It, it, it did not express any anxiety. So it wasn't the postnatal influence as much as it was the prenatal in utero influence that that uh, um, that we see. You know, programs the offspring, and then of course uh, we would expect the knockout mother, stressed out mother, and uh, the stressed out postnatal mother would, even though again the baby is wild type, uh, the 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 offspring. Um, is develops the anxious phenotype. So very interesting here, proof of concept study that that this this in utero environment represents a very unique uh, programming that is not genetic in origin. So we can't just blame it all on <clears throat> uh, you know uh, oh I've got the MTHFR I've got the COMT uh, SNP if you will uh, you know yes but how are, how those uh, are being programmed to express happens in utero. So how is this possible? Well, we see that uh, basically it, it's through this methylation that happens in utero. So if the mother is stressed out, that causes abnormal methylation, which causes epimutations in the, the, the offspring's um, genetic expression, and then we get abnormal behavior. So that's the epigenetic stress environment causes changes to offspring DNA methylation that are permanent. They really are permanent. And then the other, probably equally, uh, if not more important, is direct organ development. So we have an epigenetic mechanism, and we have the organ develop me development mechanism. So the mother, who is uh, stressed out and had an increased amount of, of, of serotonin or increased amount of stress hormones, cross the placenta, uh, cross the placenta, trigger certain cytokines that cross the blood-brain barrier in the, the, the fetus and, uh, and, all, and the developing brain as well, um, programs that brain, changes the structure. So we're talking about function and, uh, function and structure, structure and function. Both get changed in the in utero environment. Okay? The fetal epi, epigenome uh, or the fetal... Uh, Exposome, I should say, is far too large to fit into an hour talk, obviously. 
The body of fetal epigenetic liter literature, however, points to three main factors that I, that I want to get across to everyone listening. Uh, although there are hundreds, if not thousands, of factors, um, we want to try to simplify. Everything in our life is already complex and 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 uh, uh, you know makes us more stressed out. So this is this will help us to be very focused in what we talk to our patients about, what we uh, you know where our therapeutic endpoints are. So um, more will be revealed with future research. The last five years has seen an incredible amount of of um, research done on this topic, but we do know that inflammation is probably one of the, the, the most important and most damaging to uh, the fetus, to the developing fetus. Infections, the microbiome we're seeing now has a tremendous influence on, so the mother's microbiome, depending on what kind of bacteria is in the mother, that's actually programming through different organic acids and different inflammatory signals and immune signals. It's programming not only the immune system of the fetus, but the brain and the metabolism as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stress, pollutants. So we, so we see these brain immune consequences and endoimmune consequences. Nutrient deficiencies, we're seeing a lot of these. Now, they may not be overtly nutrient deficient, but given the demand, given the increased demand for the fetus, the mothers still aren't getting enough. And uh, I'll, you know, we'll go through that. So uh, especially the methyl dietary nutrients, vitamin D. Uh, in most studies, about, about 60 to 80% of women who are pregnant are vitamin D deficient. And this isn't even standard uh, on obstetric panels. This should be a standard on obstetric panels, vitamin D, it is that important. Uh, why it isn't, well, we can all speculate, but it has to be something that uh, you know everyone should be monitoring, of course, preconceptually, but at least if once they find out they're pregnant. Um, most women, according to studies, don't take vitamin D while they're pregnant. Some do, uh, but, but a lot don't. And of course, we, we see uh, if they don't and their vitamin D is low, we see developmental delays, we see brain degeneration, we see that these children um, are, uh, you know, are, are maldeveloped or, or maladapted. Iron is another big one. Again, most women develop iron deficiency at some point in their pregnancy. What does iron do in the body? Yes, in high levels it can be toxic, but... Uh, Iron carries oxygen, and it carries oxygen to the developing fetus. So, when so we call it a hypoxic environment, and and so you know really finding uh, uh, testing iron levels, testing ferritin levels, testing hemoglobin and hematocrit should be done. I believe, and I do this for my patients, should be done at least every six to eight weeks, uh, more or less depending on what their iron status is. If it's borderline low in the beginning, then it should be done every month and steps should be taken to increase the iron levels. Uh, mostly, uh, iron levels can be increased through treating the gut, increasing hydrochloric acid, increasing vitamin C in the diet, increasing the iron in the diet. But most women get enough iron, but they don't absorb enough iron. So my, my famous saying with that is ingestion does not uh, lead necessarily to digestion, all right? So ingestion does not guarantee digestion. That's why we have to really support. Um, and of course, a lot of women, when they get pregnant, develop gallbladder problems and things as well. So um, those need to be addressed. Many others, essential fatty acids, iodine, selenium, zinc, we don't have enough time to go into those. My point today is to introduce you to this concept. <clears throat> I have written an article uh, that's just coming out. This uh, it's a 40-page article going more into the de into depth in these mechanisms uh, in the December 2014 issue of Original Internist. So if you go to Clint Publications, that's C L I N T Publications.com, you can uh, download the article, and um, that information is actually at the end of these slides as well today. So, and then the materno neuroendocrine environment, the thyroid axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal axis, and the neurotransmitter metabolism, all of which have dramatic effects on the developing fetus. So what is inflammation? We'll just briefly talk about that. Acute inflammation equals tissue destruction, but what we're really talking about is chronic inflammation. 
tissue dysfunction, the increase in cytokines, the increase in release of histamine, the increase in the release of leukotrienes, the increase in the release of tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, these things cross the placental barrier and actually influence what can cross the placental barrier. We all heard, we've all heard of leaky gut, we've all heard of leaky brain. Well, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of leaky placenta. And what happens is when the placenta becomes exposed to these inflammatory chemicals, the placenta actually becomes dysfunctional. It doesn't absorb the nutrients it needs and it doesn't allow for protection for the, um, for the fetus as well. So, uh, so if the mother has leaky gut, then most likely the mother's going to have a leaky placenta as well. So <clears throat> uh, we have endogenous and, and exogenous inducers of inflammation. So these PAMPs and DAMPs here and virulence factors, lipopolysaccharides, these are all kind of from the, uh, from the uh, microbiome and from our, you know, viral load and infectious load that we have. <clears throat> of course, ingestion of allergens, irritants, foreign bodies, toxic compounds, heavy metals, all of these things induce inflammation. And one of the most uh, studied inducers of endogenous inflammation is the formation of these AGE crystals. These are advanced glycosylated end products. Uh, mother's insulin resistance is, I believe, one of the most damaging things. And probably if we singled out, you know, if you know, the most important factors in the fetal exposome, I would put insulin resistance in the top two or three uh, of damaging effects to the fetal exposome, to the fetus, to the fetal environment. So this has to be treated before, and we're not talking about do they have gestational diabetes, which we know is associated with many birth complications and many altered outcomes for the fetus, but we're talking about just high levels, slightly high levels of insulin, slightly high levels of these advanced glycosylated end products. So I check, how do we check advanced glycosylated end products? We check that through hemoglobin A1C. So I make sure that my mothers who are planning on getting pregnant, their hemoglobin A1C is at least a 5.4 or below before they get pregnant because if it's 5.5, 5.6, 5.7, then we know they're pre-diabetic, they're insulin resistant, and that fetus is going to be exposed to increased insulin, increased leptin, increased advanced glycosylated end products. Uh, the brain has receptors for these advanced glycosylated end products, for sugar, uh, if you will, for sugar byproducts. And that actually triggers microglial damage. It triggers cytokine production in the brain. And I don't need to tell you how damaging that could be to a developing brain because that is when the brain is undergoing the most rapid growth. And the brain is particularly susceptible in utero. Why is that? Because of all organs, this is fascinating as I was doing this research, but of all organs that develop in the womb, the brain is by far the most developed um, by the time the baby's born, the brain is about 80 to 90 percent of adult weight and adult, um, <clears throat> you know, the synaptic connections, 80 to 90 percent of, of those have been developed already, whereas kidney and heart and, and gastrointestinal system, those are only maybe 40 percent developed, um, you know, uh, you know, compared to an adult. So, so we see the brain undergoes the most rapid and the most sophisticated um, uh, development during the in utero environment. That's why we're seeing so many brain disorders, right? I don't need to tell you what they are, but uh, you know, we're seeing them, everything from, um, from you know, decreased developmental delay, you know, learning behaviors, um, uh, de uh, behavioral, uh, speech behaviors, uh, you know, autism, everything that we see, um, we're seeing a rise. Why is that? Well, you know, uh, there's many different theories out there, but I'm here to propose that the in utero environment, and I'm not the only one, there's many, many studies that show the in utero environment uh, has a great impact on brain development. So. Major causes of chronic inflammation, uh, allergens. I want to go through this quickly because this is the kind of things you should already know, hopefully. Um, you know, what causes inflammation in the body? What are the, what are the therapeutic uh, loci, loci that you want to uh, uh, focus on? 
So allergens, environmental allergens, food allergens, insulin resistance, treating insulin resistance. We know endogenous obesogens like leptin, insulin, adiponectin, cortisol, estrogen, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Those should all be in normal levels, optimal levels before the, the mother is born. Exogenous obesogens, um, these are things that trigger um, insulin resistance and trigger lipogenesis, increase in number and size of, of uh, fatty tissue, things like flalates, PCBs, heavy metals, iron and mercury, or not iron, lead and mercury, sorry, PFOAs, PDBEs, PFOAs, I just have a, just read a study where um, mo you know, couches, most couches have one to two pounds of, of PFOA, which is, or PDBEs, which is a flame retardant. One to two pounds. I mean, can you imagine? And the government, it mandates this because they don't want people, I mean, it's kind of left over from the 70s when people would smoke and fall asleep and the, and the couch, couch would catch fire and spontaneously combust. Well, you know, they're still mandating that pounds of flame retardants are used in the manufacture of mattresses and, and even um, electronics. So your computers and your TVs, those have a lot of flame retardants in them. But the couches, this one particular study went into many different homes and found that you know 80 to 90 percent of homes had tremendously high levels of uh, PDBEs in their couches. So of course, leaky gut uh, activated uh, activate cytokines, toll-like receptors, antigen-presenting cells, and which all of which cross the placental barrier and influence the immune system of the baby. Uh, ammonia, nitrates, amines, microbial toxins like lipopolysaccharides, those all cross the placental barrier and again create leaky placenta. Infection, dysbiosis kind of goes along with leaky gut here, um, but look for infections. Look for hidden infections again before the child is born because we see that this is a very important cause of chronic para-inflammation. So look to the gut, look to the skin, look to teeth, lungs, uh, even bone infections. These things can be asymptomatic. You have to, or at least, you know, um, dyssymptomatic, meaning that you wouldn't associate these symptoms uh, with an infection. But uh, my good friend, um, Dr. Hedberg, put together a, a good course on finding stealth infections, finding hidden infections, and treating even overt infections as well. So infectionconnection.com is, is a good website if you want to uh, uh, go there. And if you tell him that I sent you, he, he might, uh, you know, well, you can work something out with him, but tell him I sent you. And uh, again, toxins, pollutants, lack of blood flow, so sedentary lifestyle is a major cause of inflammation, nutritional deficiencies, stress, genetic SNPs, some some people are just more prone to inflammation. If you've got MTHFR SNPs, if you've got glutathione SNPs, then you just simply don't make enough of antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. So you're more susceptible to these things. And what we'll talk about today is if you do have these SNPs, if mothers and fathers have these SNPs, they're more likely to have uh, an unhealthy child or a child with impaired health. So. Um, and it's because they're not being treated. But if we if, if we can, you know, support the the antioxidant capacity, increase glutathione levels, uh, we see we'll see studies of the dramatic changes. So, um, so this is just different cytokines you can read here. Um, they do a lot of different things. Is basically the point here. This isn't a an inflammatory lecture, but uh, I, I give that in my classes. And uh, if you are interested in learning more about inflammation, and, and you know both in the in the child and the adult and in the fetus, so just make sure you're you're signed up with uh, NutriWest, and uh, and we'll let you know when when my classes are are coming around. And I'm also in the process of putting all of my lectures. I've got a hundred hour functional medicine class that will be put online um, at some point, hopefully this year, uh, early this year or next year. So NF-kappa-B is really the, the main gene promoter. So things that uh, really modulate NF-kappa-B is really what we're going after because this is the main um, mechanism behind what inflammation is and how inflammation gets triggered. So just 
we have metals and, and stresses, pathogens like lipopolysaccharides. Where do lipopolysaccharides come from? From gram-negative bacteria and pathogens in the gut, so leaky gut, toll-like receptors, so different infections as well, create an interleukin-1, which is released in tissue damage, and reactive oxygen species. We have other things too, like UV radiation and nutrient deficiencies. All of these trigger all of these complicated mechanisms that look like Greek, and I'm not going to go into each one of them, but ultimately what NF-kappa-B does and what these inflammatory signals uh, do is trigger certain uh, genetic expression of more cytokines, more adhesion molecules, which increases placking, COX-2, so you get more inflammatory joint destruction and connective tissue destruction, inducible nitric oxide synthetase, so increase in things like, you know, uh, blood pressure, BCLXL, which is, um, which is in, implicated in abnormal uh, apoptosis of cells and all of which then create more pro-inflammatory chemicals like CRP, homocysteine, IL-6, IL-1B, tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is why it's imperative. I believe CRP and homocysteine, along with vitamin D, should be on every obstetric panel, and it is on mine. Uh, when, whenever I treat uh, women who want to get pregnant or who are pregnant. That is something that, that absolutely has to be monitored. Um, CRP not only tells you what the inflammatory milieu is like in the body, but it can also uh, hearken an, an infection. So um, CRP will rise many times, um, you know, days, weeks before uh, uh, there are symptoms of an infection, but bacterial infections tend to increase CRP, whereas viral infections don't, so so CRP can be a, uh, a marker of, of a uh, bacterial or, or, or even fungal infection. So nutrients that modulate NF-kappa B, those are things that we want to encourage women to eat, right? Um, you know, and men too, because these things are important for sperm quality as well as egg quality, as well as, as offspring quality. So phytonutrients, first and foremost, eat your veggies and fruits in small quantities, glutathione, N-acetylcysteine, lipoic acid, resveratrol, grapeseed extract, uh, of course your traditional antioxidants, uh, minerals, especially zinc, selenium, magnesium I should put in there, milk thistle, cordyceps, curcumin, garlic, ginger, green tea catechins, sulforaphane, which comes from broccoli sprouts, uh, and omega-3, 6s, and 9s in, in a balanced form. These are probably the most critical nutrients that uh, um, for modulating NF-kappa B. So, and I use these a lot in my practice. Uh, NutriWest has some pretty amazing um, uh, uh, combination products that modulate this NF-kappa B that support proper, um, you know, immune and cytokine signaling. So, methyl renew is, is probably the most important one. LV renew as well, which has 100 milligrams of N-acetylcysteine. Phyto renew is, is uh, is a product that I really like. Uh, it comes in both chewable and powder, and it's concentrated phytonutrients, things like resveratrol and quercetin and glutathione and, and fruit concentrates without all the sugar, so you get the anti-inflammatory phytonutrients without all the sugar. After every workout, because most of you that know me know that I, I uh, train and I'm a, a triathlete and, and a cyclist, so after every workout, um, I put uh, my Phyto Renew powder in my Complete Way G, I put a couple scoops of that in there, and I have my um, uh, patients do that, as, and my pregnant patients do that as well. It actually, they, they many of them have reported that it helps with their nausea as well. So, so it's a good product. It's and uh, you can do the, either the chewables or or the powder. Um, I like the powder just because I do you know a lot of shakes. So, and then the Greens Renew as well, which is got the sulforaphane, it's got the, the chlorella, it's got the things that, that really help heal the gut and, and decrease the inflammation. So I put the greens renew in my shakes as well. So, uh, and then total FLM, things like complete glutathione, total alpha lipoic acid, these are all things that we're going to be talking about. Complete high potency omega-3s, I use these a lot in my practice um, to modulate the, the immune and cytokine responses. So. Here's the Phyto Renew Chewable, all the organic goodness in it, uh, as well as things like olive leaf extract and grapeseed extract and resveratrol, and then the Greens Renew with, with all the organic green goodness in there as well. So, um, so pretty powerful tools that are uh, that are simple and and easy to to implement in the lifestyle. So, in this study here, the effects of dietary polyphenols, which is 
what we were just talking about on reproductive health and early development. This was just put out a month ago. Emerging evidence from clinical and epidemiological studies suggests that dietary polyphenols play an important role in the prevention of chronic disorders, right? Uh, you know, duh, but we're seeing that specifically applied to reproductive health is kind of a new frontier. Evidence from both in vitro and in vivo studies using animals and humans demonstrates that polyphenols regulate key targets, NF-kappa B, right, CRP, interleukin-6, key targets related to oxidative stress, inflammation, and advanced glycation end products. That's why I tell people if you're going to eat uh, fruit, if you're going to eat sugar, you need to make sure you have the antioxidants. Um, because otherwise you're just making more and more advanced glycosylated end products and more and more free radicals. And um, let's see, polyphenols also have been shown to positively influence fertility and sexual development, fetal health, and the bioavailability of other nutrients. So when you take phytonutrients, you're actually increasing your absorption of your B vitamins and your vitamin D. So it's very important. And uh, these things have all been shown. And this, re and, and this uh, I do encourage you, this is actually a free article, so you can go to <clears throat> PubMed and download it for free. I encourage you, it's a great uh, review of how these polyphenols um, increase consumption is inversely related to obstetrical complications, including pre preeclampsia, intrauterine growth uh, restriction, and preterm birth, all of which those are kind of the three biggies for predicting health outcomes of the offspring. So these are things that uh, here can be modulated through, uh, through the intake of polyphenols. So very, very important. Uh, again, preeclampsia-related increase of interleukin-11. So why is preeclampsia so uh, 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 damaging to the fetus? Well, basically, it just creates this inflammatory milieu, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-11, IL-1B, all of these enhance these levels um, and, and trigger NF-kappa B. And, and the take-home message here, preeclampsia is an inflammatory event, which can be modified. Right by using these natural um, uh, polyphenols and other anti-inflammatories. So uh, here in this study, N-acetylcysteine prevents preterm birth. Again, preterm birth means low birth weight, means means less uh, development, means altered fetal growth, means you know brain possibly brain uh, alterations, organ alterations, heart alterations, insulin and leptin signaling alterations. So preterm birth, low birth weight, these are the things that are on the rise that can be modulated, that can be addressed and should be addressed uh, in, in whatever way possible. <clears throat> So uh, N-acetylcysteine prevents preterm birth by attenuating the lipopolysaccharide-induced expression of contra contractile-associated proteins in an animal model. What we're seeing here, and, and this, is, this happens in the humans as well, but what we're seeing here is maternal immune activation is one of the most damaging fetal events. Right, So if the mom gets triggered, the immune system gets triggered because of leaky gut, because of you know small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because of a parasite, because of, of dysbiosis, then all of these lipopolysaccharides become secreted, you know, um, uh, bacteria such as E. coli. Again, the mother may not be experiencing any gastrointestinal symptoms whatsoever. However, these lipopolysaccharides are being secreted and contributing to the inflammation. And here, what, what the study showed is that <clears throat> NAC may be beneficial in the prevention of MIA, which is mu, uh, maternal immune activation related preterm birth through attenuation of the NF-kappa B activation and COX-2 upregulation. So pretty powerful. I've, been, I've often asked and I often think, I don't know why I think this sometimes, but I'm often asked and think, what what's the what's the number one sort of anti-inflammatory or anti-aging, if you will, or or supportive um, nutrient? If I had to pick with just one, and thank God I don't have to pick just one because there's many. But I continuously come back to the importance of N-acetylcysteine because its role in increasing glutathione, because its role in chelating heavy metals. It's a very very uh, powerful chelator, uh, not the most powerful, but probably the most powerful that we have that's not a drug by far is N-acetylcysteine and chelating things like mercury and lead and other heavy metals. So 
So we see that NAC becomes an extremely important intervention. And uh, so, you know, this is going to be something that's really important uh, to have in your in your armament and understand how to use it. N-acetylcysteine treatment reduces mercury-induced neurotoxicity in the developing rat hippocampus. So the hippocampus is where a lot of um, a lot of, of complicated neurological functions happen, and so if the hippocampus starts to get damaged, we see developmental delays, we see language and learning uh, delays. So mercury is huge. Um, and what they did here was they did an experiment where they injected methylmercury into the postnatal uh, environment and it, it induced an in inhibition of mitosis and stimulated apoptosis in the hippocampus. So basically, it destroyed the cells immediately. And these weren't high levels of methylmercury, by the way. It was not high levels. Well, what they did in one group was they gave them N-acetylcysteine along with the methylmercury, and, uh, and it was completely blocked. That damaging, that, that apoptosis and inflammatory uh, damage was completely blocked by NAC co-incubation, so uh, as they gave the methylmercury and the NAC together, uh, it, it, it proved quite powerful. So, so this, becomes, this becomes a very, very important uh, treatment, uh, if you will, and, and um, prevention of this, this heavy metal-induced toxicity uh, in both the, the fetal environment and the adult environment as well. In January of 2015, uh, NutriWest is doing a brain symposium, and we're going to be talking about brain, and I'll be talking about the brain, the influences of brain from the womb uh, to the tomb, and I think one of the most, and what we're seeing in the literature is one of the most damaging um, effects, most damaging inputs to the, the developing brain and to the adult brain is heavy metals, and so we'll talk about how to treat heavy metal and how, you know, how to find it and how to detoxify it safely. So tune in if, you, if you're not planning on going. Uh, I really highly recommend it. I mean, what's better than January, in, you know, Phoenix in January? So 75 degrees, you can't beat that in January. So just call your NutriWest distributor uh, and find out some more information if you're not planning, haven't pl if you don't already have plans to go. So uh, all right, so inflammation and fetal programming, uh, inflammation and placental insufficiency. What do we... What do we say, what are we talking about when we say placental insufficiency? Again, we're talking about how the placenta becomes damaged. Uh, again, leaky placenta, if you will, or placental insufficiency. It becomes this issue where the, the, the function of the placenta, which is nutrient delivery to the fetus, as well as keeping out harmful substances, uh, becomes dysfunctional, and that has untold consequences to the developing fetus. Brain injury caused by chronic fetal hypoxemia, basically, again, iron deficiency in the mother or borderline anemia, and just inflammation itself create this inflammatory cascade activation increases chronic fetal hypoxemia because of the damage to the placenta, the damage to uh, nutrient delivery. And here we see that chronic fetal hypoxemia increased the lactate pyruvate and decreased the glutathione and oxidized glutathione ratios, which means the, the little glutathione that most mothers and children have because they're using it up so quickly and not making enough because they don't have enough things like N-acetylcysteine and, and they're too inflamed. Inflammation is, is a, what, what would we say, inflammation is the greatest consumer of glutathione. So if you're inflamed, even at a low level, your glutathione levels dramatically decrease. Uh, so the end result was an, a greater than 30% decrease in hippocampal neuron density just because of the uh, decreased glutathione. So glutathione delivery to the fetus is paramount. It's absolutely paramount. So that's why I do have all my mothers uh, take um, N-acetylcysteine and even postnatally if the child has some certain SNPs and has some certain health issues then you know I want to increase that as well um, you know for them put it in their formula or put it in the breast milk or whatever and acetylcysteine does cross um, the uh, or does get into milk um, but not very efficiently so sometimes it's important to supplement the child directly 
circulating pro and anticoagulant levels in normal and complicated uh, prima gravid, which means first term, first pregnancies, that it's for the first time they're pregnant, and their relationship to placental pathology. Same thing, again, we're just talking about um, if they're more inf inflamed, if they have antithrombin, protein C, protein S, increased fibrinogen, then they're more likely to have preeclampsia, low birth weight, less than the third, you know, lower than the third centile, which is, which is again, the highest risk group. So same thing, we just see that treating inflammation is most important to increase blood supply, increase nutrient supply, increase oxygen delivery to the fetus so that it can grow properly. Intrauterine effects of impaired limit, lipid homeostasis in pregnancy diseases, same thing. Uh, a high fat diet, basically, and many studies have shown that a high fat diet by a mother, and we're talking about a lot of bad fats, we're not talking about you know, a lot of good fats, we're talking about a lot of bad fats and sugars and things, it increases, to, it increases um, inflammation, which then decreases the essential fatty acid delivery to the child. So postnatal consequences may be evident in the neonatal period or later in life here. So just by being deficient, during pregnancy of, of uh, good lipids, then, uh, then that causes lifelong changes. And we're, we're talking about more than just giving somebody, giving mothers DHEA or DHA. You know, I want to really reiterate that. I get, you know, I don't want to make it overcomplicated, but I don't want to oversimplify either. Yes, EPA and DHA are extremely important, these essential fatty acids, but it is not enough. It is not going to be enough. You have to treat the inflammation at its source, and you know, really the, 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 the need of mothers um, for DHA and EPA is higher, but it's not going to itself treat leaky gut. It's not going to in itself treat uh, an infection, a stealth infection. It's not in and, in and of itself going to treat anxiety and, and, uh, and depression. It's going to help, but there's many things that have to be addressed in that situation. Uh, again, the, the nutrient deficiencies, the methyl, methylation, and, and uh, vitamin D are extremely important. So. So, um, both deficiency and excess in different lipid species can lead to the intrauterine programming of metabolic and cardiovascular diseases in the offspring. So, that's what we're trying to say. Now, here we talked about how the microbiota, and we're doing a lot, there's a lot of studies coming out about changing the maternal microbiota changes uh, the, the fetal brain development through this brain immune crosstalk. And the microbiota and neurodevelopmental windows, implications for brain disorders, Gut microbiota is essential to human health, as we know, playing a major role in the bidirectional communication between the, the brain and the central, or the gut and the central nervous system, what we call the gut-brain axis or, you know, the brain-immune axis, many different names for it. Early life perturbations of the developing gut microbiota can impact neurodevelopment and potentially lead to adverse mental health outcomes later in life. So we're not talking about, oh, okay, you know, uh, we missed a few steps in the womb. We're talking about those bricks weren't laid in the foundation, and it's impossible to go back. So that that wall that's been built, that house that's been built, uh, is more susceptible to crumbling later in life with, like we said, the two-hit theory or the multiple-hit theory. The concept of parallel and interacting microbial neural critical windows opens new av avenues for developing novel microbiota-modulated Base therapeutic interventions in early life. So we're talking about preconception, in utero, and postnatal is the early life environment. And it ha does combat neurodevelopmental deficits and brain disorders. So again, this is a great review. I encourage everyone to, to see how changing the microbiota, not just giving somebody probiotics, I mean, hopefully we're all a little more sophisticated than that. Yes, giving somebody probiotics is important, but treating the, the, the gut health, treating you know, the causes of why the gut is leaky in the first place, dietary modulation, um, you know, increasing the number of, of uh, vegetables and fibers that the person is eating, the prebiotics, the stress levels, melatonin, as I've uh, mentioned before, is one of my absolute uh, most powerful um, treatments that I use for leaky gut. Um, and again, I uh, go into that in my classes, but melatonin is really important for treating leaky gut. So these things are, are really important to treat. Uh, 
preconception because it's much harder to treat and much more risky, obviously, to treat uh, while the person is pregnant. So, um, so in this maternal gluten-free diet reduces inflammation and diabetes, diabetes incidence in the offspring. All right, so in the offspring, so the, when the mom eats a gluten-free diet, the children and the offspring, when all other factors are equal, postnatal diet and exposures to pollutants and even genetics, because these, these were all genetically identical uh, mice, uh, a gluten-free diet is known to, to well, in, in humans and in children, decrease the incidence of type 1 diabetes. And what they saw here was that the maternal uh, gluten-free uh, diet in dramatically decreased the incidence of diabetes and insulitis in these children. And again, we know the mechanisms uh, are through the, the uh, leaky gut, through the increased intestinal uh, permeability, through the activation of toll-like receptors and antigen-presenting cells, which end up creating a lot of antibodies to many different tissues, including the pancreas. The pancreas is, is very much uh, damaged when the mother eats gluten and dairy as well. Both of those uh, program the baby, the offspring, to develop antibodies to uh, different tissues, thyroid uh, and many different other things too. So, uh, And the gut microbiota uh, revealed a pronounced difference between both mothers and their offspring on different diets. This is why I say it's more than just giving somebody probiotics. You have to change their diet. And what we saw is that just gluten-free diet dramatically changed the microbiota environment here. So, so extremely, extremely important. So, and we call this the gut primed uh, immune cells to the pancreas. It's what we're saying. The leaky gut primes the immune system to go after the pancreas and brain as well. Uh, I, say I, have I have brain, I have pancreas in here, but we have many studies where also this exact same mechanism uh, produces antibodies to the developing brain, which, as we know, things like autism uh, are antibody related. The, the baby has been gut primed, if you will. The immune cells have been gut primed to go after uh, tissues in the brain and tissues um, elsewhere as well. So, so really important. So we have genetic susceptibility here. Uh, and, and a lot of this, a lot of childhood disorders have been focused on what is the genetic susceptibility. And yes, you know, we know things like MTHFR and the COMT increases genetic susceptibility. However, uh, it's the environmental insults that have to be there. Um, you know, both of these are, are uh, necessary. Um, not, probably neither one of these are sufficient to cause, um, you know, things like autism, but both of them have to be there uh, to, in order to develop. So what we see is the neural crest, neural tube, and cortex is, is all exposed to the environmental insults. And again, they're going to be more susceptible to environmental insults given genetic susceptibilities, uh, which is why we're seeing the genetic component. But again, the environmental insult has to be there. So we have damage to the peripheral nervous system, right? And we have damage to also the central nervous system as well. And we have damage to the peripheral immune system. So neurodevelopmental, neuroimmunological developmental uh, disorders, abnormal autonomic regulation, sounds like autism, or I mean, sounds like uh, 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 autoimmune, compositional dysbiosis, uh, lifelong problems with the gut and immune system, other atypical immune-mediated responses like atopy, right, allergies, um, psoriasis infections, uh, or, uh, you know, a different type of uh, um, susceptibility to seasonal allergies as well. So, so here we have, you know, the autoimmune, allergy disorders, all of these things um, are an interplay between the genetics and environment. And, and we can't do a whole lot about this except you know, provide proper methylation. The genetic susceptibility is mitigated by providing proper methyl groups like the MTHFR. So even if the child has a lot of, of SNPs that, um, that are, make it more susceptible to lower glutathione levels, for instance, providing the NAC, providing the, the methyl groups, the methylfolate and things, um, decrease uh, the genetic susceptibility through these epigenetic um, uh, uh, mechanism. So neuroimmune abnormalities in, in autism. So this, again, this is a great, uh, uh, great article as well. 
Uh, developmental maternal origins, well, we basically already talked about this, uh, so I'll go through it uh, briefly. But we're talking about maternal origins of increased intestinal permeability, so leaky gut. So the, so the baby has leaky gut because the mom has leaky gut, and it's because of what the mom is eating. So, and other things too, taking antibiotics uh, and not replenishing the proper microbiota, many different factors there. In this study, I thought this is one of the great, you know, uh, one of the best studies uh, at just highlighting the importance of the maternal diet. Many women don't really know, and men don't know, that what they eat during pregnancy is going to last uh, in their child. It's going to have lasting effects on their child for the rest of uh, that child's life. So in this study here, um, if, if the mothers had a good quality Mediterranean diet, not a low quality Mediterranean diet, but a good quality Mediterranean diet, so a lot of plants, a lot of vegetables, a lot of good, good fats, a lot of nuts and seeds and whole foods and fish and things um, you know, that, that weren't toxic. They, they, if the mothers had a, a good adherence to a Mediterranean diet compared to mothers with a poor diet or a low quality Mediterranean diet, they, their children had far less chance of, uh, of persistent wheeze, atopic wheeze, and atopy, which is skin, you know, dermatitis kind of things, at age six and a half years after adjusting for many, many, many potential confounders like postnatal diet, for instance. So they got rid of, you know, um, the, 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 the postnatal diet and, and, and tried to isolate just the maternal diet had the greatest impact, even more than the postnatal diet. So this is huge to understand that, um, uh, you know, of course, childhood adherence to a Mediterranean diet also is negatively associated as well. So it is important. <laughs> the, I'm not saying the postnatal environment is not important. I'm saying that the prenatal uh, maternal diet is is far more important than we ever thought uh, before. So very, very important. Same study, uh, same kind of thing, prenatal and childhood Mediterranean diet and the development of asthma and allergies in children. Um, you know, same, same author, different type of uh, study that they looked at. Um, and just again, highlighting the importance of, of, of the maternal diet. Early life stress induces visceral hypersensitivity. So basically, uh, early life stress. So if the mom is stressed out, um, maternal, uh, you know, if the, if the mom has high levels of cortisol, for instance, then that's going to create a visceral hypersensitivity, which is really what we're talking about is the leaky gut and, um, and the preconditions for developing autoimmune disease later in life. So, so stress is also as important as diet. Um, many studies have shown that women who have a very stressful environment, uh, they're, they're not going to be, uh, their, their babies aren't going to be as, as healthy. Uh, same thing, fetal growth restriction, um, uh, just by reducing the amount of um, uh, blood flow to the baby here, same thing. So blood flow is important in reducing the free radical formation, which is why exercise is really important. Movement, you got to get the blood flow to the fetus. So, so mothers should not be sedentary at all. They should be moving, getting that blood flowing. You know, they don't have to go out and run marathons, but they, you know, they should be moving around, walking and, and doing some light types of exercises. Um, even weightlifting, there's some studies that show mothers who do a small amount of weightlifting program the baby to be leaner and have greater muscle mass um, through, the rest, through the rest of that child's life. So, so lots of factors here, and I wanted to just introduce you all to these concepts um, and, and, you know, not to, so, so that you can do your own research, that, so that you can really um, uh, use this to talk about uh, talk to your patients about this. Um, now, maternal obesity, I think, is, as we talked about, one of the most damaging fetal events. Um, so if the, the mom has increased weight, either pre-pregnancy or also what's associated with altered fetal programming is gaining too much weight. So this is why it's really, really important. In fact, even the British Nutrition Foundation, um, which is, they wrote a huge, a very nice book uh, that I referenced at the end of these slides here. Um, 
British Nutrition Foundation had, wrote a book, and even they recommend that women don't even need to gain weight or increase their calorie consumption until the third trimester. And really, even then, it's only about an extra 100 to 150 calories a day. Now, we're not talking about starving women. We're not saying that. We're talking about you know, making sure that women do not, well, they're not, they don't go into pregnancy uh, overweight because, because as we're going to see, the, the increase in free fatty acids, the increase in leptin, the increase in uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines have damaging effects on all organs, not just the brain, but the heart and the kidney and, and every other organ as well, and lungs. So making sure that women are of good weight going in, and men too, because maternal obesity or paternal obesity is also associated with altered fetal outcomes. Um, so, so really important that the males uh, as well, because we're talking about decreased sperm quality and a lot of epigenetic changes, even though we're focusing on the mother and the maternal environment today because it's so prolonged, the, mater the paternal environment, the, the, you know, the, the, the production and the quality of sperm uh, has dramatic epigenetic changes, uh, and, and in many cases, even the maternal environment can't overcome uh, an inflammatory paternal environment that has been transferred into the sperm. So just want to give that little uh, important um, uh, piece as well. Uh, which we'll get to in a second here. But so we see just maternal obesity increases reactive oxygen species, increases free fatty acids, increases inflammation. And we see that the babies are already born with atherosclerosis, already born with elevated blood pressure, already born with altered kidney and, and uh, angiotensin, uh, you know, nitric oxide systems. They already are pre-programmed for cardiovascular disease, pre-programmed for type 2 diabetes, pre-programmed for chronic kidney problems like microalbuminuria, decreased nephron number, hyperfiltration, glomerular and proximal tubule remodeling. All of these are happening in the womb because of maternal obesity, because of increased reactive oxygen species. Like I said earlier, this here, this slide here, is metabolic uh, reprogramming that's, uh, that is, is non-genetic. Basically, um, we're just seeing a remodeling and a restructuring of organs like kidney and heart. But then we also have altered DNA methylation, histone modification, and non-coding RNA-mediated silencing processes. Basically, the endoplasmic reticulum, which is where the genes uh, ultimately get processed into making um, into making a, 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 the end product enzyme or protein that gets damaged because of the increased reactive oxygen species so in, in extremely extremely important to understand these mechanisms none of which are being tested for uh, we see non-alcoholic fatty liver disease on the rise so if and and how we diagnose that on lab test is simply um, Elevated triglycerides and elevated liver enzymes, and and we I'm seeing this uh, in, in 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 skyrocketing uh, amounts, and and if you're running your liver enzymes on on every patient, if you're running triglycerides on on your patient, you're going to see this happening. So. So extremely, extremely important that this and and these are all actually easily reversed and you know through dietary and and nutrient modification. I mean, I have countless of case studies of reversal of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's it's quite responsive to natural treatments. So just like you know diabetes and things. So um, <clears throat> quite responsive. So again, just another schematic of maternal stress, infection, undernutrition. Again. Iron, vitamin D, uh, methylfolate, those are the top three that come to mind. Placental dysfunction, you know, exposure to smoke, exposure to alcohol, causes altered in utero programming, causes low birth weight, changes in growth metabolism, vasculature, and then contributes to altered organ function, altered genetic function, which then pre-programs the babies. And what I'm seeing, well, what I, the reason why I put this slide in here is because I want people to understand the transgenerational effect. So um, the, 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 the children who are having children today were themselves altered children in the womb because of their maternal inflammation. So we're seeing somewhere around the, the 40s and 50s, the baby boom generation, they were kind of the first uh, in utero experiment, if you will, um, exposures to 
chemicals and flalates and inflammation and dietary modifications that have never been, uh, uh, you know, happened. They've never been happened. Never happened before um, in, in human history. So, so the baby boom generation is the first kind of altered fetal programming, and then they. Uh, have altered offspring, which then grows up to have more postnatal insults, which they're already susceptible for more problems, and then they have children that they're just passing down more and more of these genetic and epigenetic transgenerational um, um, uh, problems. You know, no other way to say it. It's it's a problem that can be dealt with, that can be treated, uh, that can be uh, modified. So that's what the whole point of today is. So again, N-acetylcysteine prevents congenital heart defects induced by pregestational diabetes. So if, if a mother has pregestational diabetes, we know that it contributes to congenital heart defects for the baby. That's how dramatic of an effect <clears throat> Excuse me. That's how dramatic of an effect increase of uh, advanced glycosylated end products and insulin has on the developing heart and other organs too. But giving children and giving mothers actually uh, while they're pregnant, N-acetylcysteine actually decreases the incidence of these um, of these congenital heart you know defects and other uh, abnormalities. It's quite amazing to me. I I really hope all of you listening get the goosebumps that I get when I do these the, the research. It is tremendously powerful. Why is this not first-line therapy? Why is this not taught in medical schools? Well, we don't want to go there. It's not taught in any school. It's up to us to do these this post-doctoral uh, education and training. So, um, uh, again, maternal homocysteine and pregnancy and offspring birth weight. Uh, just saying that homocysteine here is inversely related to fetal growth. So in, the higher the homocysteine, the lower uh, the fetal growth, the more um, uh, fetal developmental delays we're going to see. So here even this article says, and you can see a lot of these are fairly new, um, which is great. It's, it, it's just exploding in the last few years. But reducing maternal homocysteine concentrations may improve fetal growth. Hey, I, I don't. It's about as simple and as non-hype way of saying it. Uh, we have to reduce homocysteine. <clears throat> and there is no pediatrician that I know of or, or obstetrician that runs hem uh, homocysteine, not one. Yet it's probably one of the most important tests to do. So, um, and, and that also makes it more individualized. So why should every woman take 800 micrograms of folic acid, right? There are some women, especially the more obese you are, uh, and again, in the, the, the uh, British Journal uh, 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 the, or the British um, Nutrition Foundation recommends that if you have, if you're overweight, that you should be taking five milligrams, up to five milligrams of methylfolate while you're pregnant in order to avoid, you know, developmental fetal delays and, and, and altered fetal uh, growth. So, so really important um, to 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 look at this and to to treat it, and that that way, it, homocysteine allows for greater control and greater individualization of you know what you're giving your your patient, what the mother is taking. So, do they need one? Do they need five milligrams of of methylfolate? Well we run the homocysteine and we give them what they need until we start seeing the homocysteine uh, concentration go down. Uh, let's see, just wanted to give a brief um, introduction to how pharmaceutical, most women, I just read this article, that most women take three to five medications on average, this is on average. A pregnant woman in this country takes three to five medications. I had no idea when I read that article, but it, it's three to five medications. Now, I want to, the, the most studied, if you will, the most potentially damaging is pharmaceutical use. It's, it's widespread um, in, in the pregnant uh, population. So I just wanted to give a few studies uh, here that show that that is a very negative, in many cases, a very negative fetal programming event. So uh, you can read these here, acute and long-term behavioral outcomes. So we're talking about uh, you know, mothers who take these pharmaceuticals, uh, their children are then born with 
uh, altered behavioral outcomes, you know, motor activity, altered uh, autonomic and motor activity, habituation, sleep, uh, many different changes. Fortunately, it's, uh, it's not as much uh, cognitive, although there is, but it's mostly gross motor and language development. And here it's controversial, like probably everything I'm saying today, but it's controversial because what's worse? Is it the pharmaceutical or is it depression? Because severe depression is a very negative fetal programming insult. How it changes the brain chemistry of the fetus if the mother's very depressed, it does need to be treated. But as you've seen and as you've heard in my other lectures, there's so many ways to treat uh, the source of depression, which is usually the gut and inflammation, uh, things like St. John's wort and essential fatty acids and uh, lipoic acid and even N-acetylcysteine and of course the methylfolate are, are, are as effective as pharmaceuticals without the potential side effects. So again, parental depression, maternal antidepressant use during pregnancy and risk of autism spectrum disorders. So we do see that there is uh, a link here between some pharmaceutical use, especially antidepressants, uh, whether it is a, an SSRI or uh, a monoamine reuptake inhibitors, a tricyclic antidepressant. So both of those, both of those in utero exposures by the fetus uh, was associated with an increased risk of autism spectrum disorders, particularly without intellectual disability. So we're talking about more behavioral um, and social disability than we are intellectual disability, but nonetheless, uh, uh, you know, somewhere on the autism spectrum disorder. So, so and the odds ratio here is three and a, it's three times greater, three and a half times greater. This is not insignificant. This is very, very important. So again, important to address these issues preconceptually and not, you know, when they get pregnant. And again, increase the the dialogue with your patients. If you have a patient who is depressed and, and they're at reproductive age, you know, just giving them certain clues that, hey, you know, if you're depressed, you actually have a greater risk of, of, of having a child with autism, so let's treat it now. It can really increase motivation. So uh, again, antidepressants and autism spectrum disorder, so another meta-analysis, another study, um, not just one. Antinatal depression and antidepressants during pregnancy, unraveling the complex interactions. So we're just talking here a little bit more about the mechanisms, obviously the SSRIs across the placental barrier. Do we really want an increase? amount of serotonin in the developing brain because then the brain becomes serotonin resistant. In, anytime it has an increased amount of something, it's often going to develop a resistance to that. So a dopamine resistance, a serotonin resistance, and altered serotonin metabolism, altered tryptophan metabolism, these things are all proven to be part of the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, Let's talk a little bit, now I'm changing the uh, focus here a little bit, uh, uh, some other uh, potential interventions. Um, lipoic acid prevention of neural tube defects, so we've all heard about methylfolate, okay, uh, and how that, or folic acid I should say, um, and, but I believe it should be methylfolate, how that can uh, reduce neural tube defects, but here we're seeing actually lipoic acid uh, is very important, again, because it's reducing the um, inflammation in reactive oxygen species and allows proper organogenesis to occur. It allows the brain and the heart and the liver and the kidneys to develop without the increased fetal demand of reactive oxygen species and inflammation. Um, peripheral neuropathy in, in obstetrics, uh, this is just a, um, a study that shows, you know, for many, many, many years, alpha lipoic acid has been used to treat pregnant women with um, peripheral neuropathy like sciatica, which is a common condition, and a lot of you uh, are chiropractors uh, listening, and so we do treat a lot of, of um, pregnant women with back pain, and, and the study saying here is that, again, every doctor is responsible for, you know, their own decisions and their own, you know, we're not saying that uh, every woman should be treated with lipoic acid in any way, but we're saying here, and this study shows that it has a, 
a high safety profile and again making this molecule a novel candidate. Data reported so far are promising and dietary supplementation with lipoic acid seems a useful tool uh, to contrast neuropathic pain during pregnancy. But we're also t not talking about just treating. The nice thing about lipoic acid is it's not just treating the peripheral neuropathy, but it's supporting fetal development as well. Um, and uh, you can you can read this. This is just about how lipoic acid works at reducing the NF kappa B. Sound familiar? Yes, it's an anti-inflammatory, and uh, and that's how it can uh, support many uh, different processes in 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 the in the in the developing fetus. Epigenetics of brain and behavior and offspring. So um, so how does this fetal environment, how does the maternal environment affect brain? Well, we've already talked about this. You know, we've already talked about it quite a bit. But I wanted to highlight a study here. Uh, again, it's a free study. I think it's a great review article. Um, it's in. Uh, it's called Developmental Programming of Brain and Behavior by Perinatal Diet, Focus on Inflammatory Mechanisms. Again, decreasing the inflammation is probably the single greatest thing we can do to improve uh, the next generation. Uh, I just there, you know. I said it. It's it's there. It's probably the single greatest thing that we can do. It's not the only thing, but it's the single greatest thing. So, so um, offspring of mothers fed a high fat diet, which is just one way to induce inflammation during pregnancy, showed increase. So the offspring of the mothers fed this this high diet and an inflammatory diet increased anxiety like behavior across multiple species, including non human primates. So we're talking about uh, all of the animals studied, which you know, and we see it in humans too. So the study is just saying that yes, you know, we see it in in all animals, even in the absence of direct postnatal feeding. So by the time you know the postnatal uh, diet, it's important, but for brain development, it's it's less important, not not non important, but less important than the maternal diet. So so and this is kind of how it works. Maternal high fat diet changes the intrauterine environment, changes the postnatal environment, and increases these inflammatory mechanisms. Here we see that it damages the placenta. One of the things here I thought was very interesting is that inflammation, no matter from what source, whether it's leaky gut, whether it's infection, one of the mechanisms here is it decreases 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. Okay, yeah, I know that's a long word, but uh, some of you are thinking about biochemistry class now in school. What this does is it takes cortisol and converts it into cortisone, which doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't have the uh, same um, you know, damaging effect that, that cortisol has. So so we see that any time we get circulating cytokines, increased glucocorticoids, we get a decrease of these 11 beta hydroxysteroid uh, enzymes so that more glucocorticoids can cross the placental barrier and alter the brain development of both males and females of the, of the fetus. So, and it causes placental insufficiency. Here we see this is part of the mechanism of leaky placenta. You know, um, I haven't seen that term in the literature, so maybe I can, you know, I, I can claim that, but I doubt it. Some, I'm sure, many people have said this before. But leaky placenta is is uh, is damaging on many, many, many different levels. Then we get inflammatory mechanisms that damage the epigenetics, right? So we get hypomethylation. Again, an important point: inflammation induces hypomethylation. Let me repeat: inflammation induces hypomethylation. Again, inf inflammation induces hypomethylation. So really important then, we see that uh, it leaves the genes more susceptible to producing uh, abnormal events and abnormal development. And also the developing brain then gets saturated with uh, trans fats and bad fatty acids. It altered myelination. We need methylation in order to produce myelination. Pro-inflammatory cytokines damage the axon, damage the, the, uh, the immature neuron. And so then we see uh, increased cytokines, decreased serotonin function, and increased risk of psychiatric disorders in both males and females. So. Um, so interesting inflammatory mechanisms and things that can be modified. We already know how to modify it. It's just important to apply what we know to this population. And a couple of other things, elevated maternal CRP and autism. I thought this was a, a very important um, study that links, again, inflammation through CRP. Now, 
I want to reiterate that many women have, many, many people, men and women, have inflammation and don't have high CRP. So it's not a rule out test, but if you have elevated levels of CRP, you definitely have inflammation. I hope that's clear to everyone listening that, because uh, I, I do a lot of consults and I've heard, you know, multiple times patients or, or doctors call me, well, I ran a CRP and it was normal, so they're not inflamed. Ugh, that is not the case. Just because their CRP is level, uh, normal, it doesn't mean that uh, that they're not inflamed. It just means that inflammation is happening through different mechanisms. CRP is specific to interleukin-6, but there are many different interleukins that get elevated, um, you know, that, that, that produce just as damaging effects, but CRP levels and IL-6 levels may be normal. So here, with elevated CRP levels, you had a 43% elevated risk. This is quite phenomenal. This is, this is a huge correlation. No matter what the cause of elevated CRP levels, it increases the risk. And of course, now then, our job is when we find the elevated CRP levels to find the source of the inflammation, what did we already say? Uh, obesity, pollutants and toxicity, um, infections, leaky gut, right? We, we know how to go about finding the sources of inflammation and treating them. So, so very, very important. Maternal antioxidants prevent beta cell apoptosis. So what we're talking about here is uh, exposure to a pollutant damages the uh, pancreas, which then leaves the fetus more susceptible to uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And here, uh, giving, uh, along with the exposure to, to nicotine here was what they used, they uh, gave vitamin E, CoQ10, and alpha lipoic acid, and it increased, it actually decreased, it prevented the beta cell loss. So, so the antioxidant intervention to nicotine exposed dams prevented the beta cell loss and apoptosis observed in these um, uh, nicotine exposed uh, um, uh, fetuses and, and offspring. So um, quite, quite important, just making sure the antioxidant levels, CoQ10 is one of my uh, number one things that I give um, to both male, males and females for um, good, proper, you know, for offspring development. It is one of the most important things. And yes, personally, I do use a lot of alpha lipoic acid as well and, and acetylcysteine. I, I don't use a lot of vitamin E. I try to get that in through the diet, but, it, but you can, you know, do that as well. Uh, again, antioxidant therapies, just proving that uh, positive evidence for uses of melatonin and alpha lipoic acid and vitamin C and E in increasing uh, fetoplacental oxidative balance. So, so uh, what we're saying here is oxidation creates this um, imbalance, which produces abnormal brain development and abnormal organ development, but antioxidants were neuroprotective, protecting the developing brain from the maternal fetal insults. These you know, don't know what better, how better way to say it. This is as plain as can be, and, and it's just not practiced enough, in my opinion. Um, and with the rise of the adult and childhood disorders that we're seeing, it is, the time is now. And it is imperative to start implementing these things, um, you know, and, and, and supporting the, the future generations, current generations. Again, N-acetylcysteine reduces the inflammatory response to lipopolysaccharides. So if the mother has leaky gut or if the mother has uh, an inf dysbiosis, giving NAC stops the inflammatory expression and protects the fetus, fetal brain. Okay, methylation and infertility, this isn't anything new. Um, you know, the mother needs folic acid, and we're talking about fertility here. Um, what we know is what helps fertility also helps the fetus develop. So, so fertility is different, right? Fertility is just the ability to get pregnant, whereas fetal development is the ability to produce a viable offspring, a healthy offspring. But what we see is even though those two are different, they they essentially are are influenced by the same thing. So the antioxidants and the and the uh, the folic acid, especially the methylfolate, one of the most important things for um, for fertility and prevention of miscarriage and you know the promotion of 
proper fetal development. Um, same, same thing, maternal nutrition. C1 metabolism means folate, you know, basically methylation metabolism. Um, a review of current evidence in human subjects. What we see is that periconceptual. So we're talking about preconception as well as during conception as well as postnatal. So we group those three periods, pre-conception, um, uh, prenatal and postnatal, we all we call those periconceptual. Um, it changes, completely changes the offspring phenotype. So really important to, to understand that. Uh, which is why I have them take a lot of women of reproductive age and men too. They just take methylfolate. They take about uh, you know one milligram uh, a day, um, no matter what. At least that if they get pregnant um, they're producing good sperm, they're producing quality sperm, quality eggs, and uh, and then once they do get pregnant, then we can increase that if needed. So again, uh, periconceptual folic acid intake, most women, 80% of women do not take folic acid before they get pregnant. And so uh, the, the neural tube is already being developed by the time they know they're pregnant and by the time um, they start taking folic acid. So again, it's important to do it pre-conceptually, pre-conceptually before they get pregnant, before they even think about getting pregnant. So um, they need that methyl groups. They need the antioxidants. Okay. So we see that if they don't do it uh, pre-conceptually, then they have a greater risk, even if they start taking it after the first month of pregnancy. So this study is extremely, extremely important. After the first month of pregnancy, in many ways, it's too late. It's just too late um, for some. It's not too late for the baby. It's not a, a, a fait accompli. It's not, uh, you know, but some damage has been done, and, and it, it's, it's, it's almost incomprehensible because it's so easily, uh, you know, avoided, okay? Um, again, uh, periconceptual folic acid uh, reduces the autism spectrum disorder risk. Um, prenatal and postnatal epigenetic programming, implications for GI immune and neuronal function, same thing. Systemic deficits in the antioxidant glutathione causes all of these problems in the prenatal epigenetic programming. Um, just another study reiterating the same things that we've talked about, increasing the antioxidant capacity. This is just a schematic of how oxidative stress, gluten, and casein can actually stop the, so even if you give somebody uh, N-acetylcysteine, which is the precursor to glutathione, uh, it doesn't get transported inside the cell because of this um, excitatory amino acid transporter. Just a very interesting mechanism that oxidative stress, inflammation, eating gluten or casein can stop even the the ability of cysteine to get inside the cell, which is really where we want it. I mean, we want glutathione outside of the cell as well, but we want it inside the cell to protect the cell development. So, um, so just interesting. You've got to do cysteine along with the N-acetylcysteine, along with the anti-inflammatories, along with, you know, a good diet. So, so my preconception and prenatal methylation support, methylcobalamin, 1 to 5 milligrams a day. Uh, I do 1 to 4 milligrams, again, depending on their homocysteine levels, depending on their genetic SNPs, if you've run those. We want to bio-individualize this, which is why I have sort of large uh, numbers here, but B6, B3, biotin, B2, magnesium, molybdenum, zinc, and acetylcysteine, 500 to 1,000 milligrams, even more, if, especially if they have PCOS um, or pregestational diabetes or elevated blood sugar, we want more N acetylcysteine in there, and even SAMe, especially if they're having depression, um, you know, prenatal depression or postnatal depression as well. It's very very, very helpful for both the mother and the offspring. So these are things that I want to make sure uh, are included uh, in the preconception and prenatal uh, environment and plan. Um, you know, so so I use uh, Methyl Renew by NutriWest uh, because it has all of those things in there. Uh, I mean, it has a hundred milligrams of. of of SAMe has 100 milligrams of N-acetylcysteine. It's got the sulforaphane. Uh, there was just a study uh, that came out a month ago that showed actually sulforaphane uh, in 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 a child anyway, a child that's developing or has 
autistic symptoms, uh, sulforaphane has lowered all of their autistic scores. It, it lowered the symptoms of autism. So, um, but sulforaphane, as we saw, is an NF-kappa B inhibitor. Uh, modulator, so methyl renew, yes, it supports methylation, but I think it's probably the most antioxidant producing supplement that NutriWest has in their lineup by far. I mean, look at the ingredients. It's got, um, you know, it's got the sephoraphane, N acetylcysteine, phosphatidylcholine for proper um, brain development green tea catechins, the s acetylcysteine, curcumin, intrinsic factor, and the pyridoxal 5-phosphate, which is the activated form of, of B6, uh, plus the methylfolate, plus the niacin. So um, so this is, this is, I think, you know, you've heard me talk about this before. I think everybody should be on at least one or two, regardless of your methylation SNP. Uh, status, your gene status, but if you are more inflamed, if you're obese, if you're stressed, then then you need to, to you have a greater demand in your methylation and you probably need more of these. So so really important to to provide these to your patients if you if they need and then uh, you can give them more uh, L5 MTHF if you want. So on average, I'm just telling you what I do. Most of my pregnant women are taking one or two methyl renew, and then if their homocysteine and CRP is still high, then of course, you know, we're giving them the complete high potency omegas. We're giving them, um, you know, the, the the multivitamins. We're giving them many different things as well, which we'll talk about. So um, these are kind of just a review of what's in there. Uh, the sephoraphane, the green tea. Um, just want to talk briefly. I already talked about this, but uh, the males don't get a free pass. You know, they they need just as much support to produce healthy um, sperm as well. And here, interestingly enough, to prove the point that age-related sperm DNA methylation changes are transmitted to offspring and associated with abnormal behavior and dysregulated gene expression. Uh, so if the father has altered DNA methylation while he's producing the, the sperm, that sperm will carry that altered DNA methylation throughout the lifespan of the offspring. Huge point to make uh, how important it is. And so here, an offspring from old fathers, uh, older fathers, also had transcriptional dysregulation of developmental genes implicated in autism and schizophrenia. So what we're seeing is that the older the male as well, uh, the more DNA methylation problems. It doesn't mean that if you're a 45-year-old male, you can't have a healthy offspring. You just need to make sure you're taking enough methyl groups and, and anti-inflammatories and N-acetylcysteine uh, and things to produce that, um, uh, to prevent the sperm, spermatotoxicity here. Uh, again, increased chemicals, reactive oxygen species, genetic damage, and, uh, and, and we want to uh, remove the spermatotoxicity and increase the um, sperm quality. Here we're talking about again uh, generation of reactive oxygen species creates uh, 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 damage to the, to the sperm through endocrine disrupting chemicals. So removing NAC reversed oxidative stress and prevented the loss of sperm function in the DES or BPA treated group. So N-acetylcysteine prevented the damage of BPA, which is a plastic, to the sperm and uh, prevented the genetic damage um, to the offspring as well. Nutrient supplementation, improving male fertility fourfold. Uh, half of all infertility problems, it's about 50-50, half are males and half are females, and many are both, actually. So these things, carnitine, vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, carotenoids, glutathione, N-acetylcysteine, zinc, folic acid, and CoQ10 have all been proven in this Cochrane review to increase <clears throat> um, not only uh, pregnancies, but uh, live birth rates and, and positive fetal outcomes as well. So can you guess which of this, uh, let's see, we get back here. Can you guess which of these sperm need a little extra antioxidant support, some methylfolate and N-acetylcysteine? Yeah. <laughs> this is not the sperm you want to be, uh, you know, crossing uh, into the next generation here. So uh, he needs a little bit more support. Uh, again, talking about diet too. Diet uh, increases sperm activity and sperm quality. So um, 
keeping that in mind is important for the for the males as well. Thyroid and fetal development, I just want to briefly talk about this because it's so important. I don't want to go into the specific mechanisms, but a maternal early pregnancy and newborn thyroid hormone parameters, basically what we're saying here is even subclinical hypothyroidism, even a, a TSH between 2.5 and 4.5, which is considered normal, even that has an increased uh, risk for um, low thyroid levels in the pregnancy and altered fetal outcomes like autism and, and asthma and many different things. So maternal thyroid function in the first 20 weeks of pregnancy is completely dependent uh, and the, the baby's is completely dependent on thyroid levels from the mother. So if there's any subclinical or clinical hypothyroidism, we associate this with increased fetal loss, low birth weight, congenital circulation, congenital heart problems, but even subclinical is associated with neurodevelopmental delay, um, ADD, ADHD, increased fetal distress, preterm delivery, poor vision development, etc. So addressing thyroid problems is extremely, extremely important from a functional medicine standpoint, not from just running a TSH, but running your TSH, running your T3, T4, your reverse T3, your free T3, um, the 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 free thyroxine index, the T3 uptake, all of those things need to be to to be addressed. Running your thyroid peroxidase antibodies and dealing with that before um, before pregnancy is absolutely imperative. Okay, um, here in this study, supplementation with iodine and selenium reduced the risk of infertility, miscarriages, fetal morbidity, morbidity, low birth weight, and neurological deficits and preterm deliver, de, deliver uh, neuro, preterm delivery. If the mother had TPO positive antibodies, just supplementing with iodine and selenium reduced the risk of these to the offspring. Extremely, extremely important to get these levels checked. You know, check their iodine, check the selenium levels, um, check the thyroid levels, check the thyroid peroxidase antibody levels. Now, obviously, you want to be careful. Um, don't want to get into the controversy of iodine supplementation and, and Hashimoto's and thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Uh, what I will say is, is you want to check the thyroid peroxidase antibody levels very carefully and closely if you are giving somebody iodine and they are TPO positive, positive antibodies. Personally, I don't believe that's automatically a contraindication in any way, shape, or form. But you do need to be careful because in some people it will raise the, temp the TPO antibodies um, temporarily, usually, but uh, well, you want to make sure it doesn't dramatically increase it. And so starting with low levels of iodine and, and working your way up if you need to is the way to go. And of course, we're talking about doing this preconceptually, not during pregnancy. Again, you have to be careful. Um, you know, the mother may still need iodine and may benefit from that, but it's much harder to treat especially Hashimoto's or any autoimmune once they're, once they're pregnant. And you do need to be careful because too much iodine can also cause a problem uh, in the developing fetus and, and predispose the developing fetus to a greater risk for developing thyroid peroxidase antibody and Hashimoto's later in life. But again, like many things in, in nature, too little and too much seem to have this similar effects. So we want to individualize what the, uh, each person needs. So, um, so you can check your urinary iodine clearance levels, um, thyroid levels every two months during pregnancy or every month if they have a history of thyroid disorders, which I do. I want to check and I want to make sure um, thyroid levels aren't checked traditionally during pregnancy, but it is the number one hormonal input to proper brain and organ development to the fetus. That's why I'm spending a few minutes of time on this. Um, again, just a study showing even small perturbations of um, thyroid hormone, you know, even low levels uh, cause hippocampal damage and neocortex damage in the developing brain. And uh, Thyroid inadequacy during gestation is a risk factor for adverse pregnancy and developmental outcomes. Um, just like we've talked about, it's the critical windows here that's very, very important. Maternal hypothyroidism and autism, again, is, there's an association here with maternal hypothyroxinemia and increased autism risk as well. So it's imperative that we get these levels to optimal 
uh, amounts before pregnancy. <clears throat> and then just having uh, uh, a low thyroid increases your risk fourfold for having an autistic child. Huge um, implications here. So, and the connection between thyroid and inflammation, as we talked about, uh, inflammation is one of the most damaging fetal inputs. Um, uh, if you have subclinical hypothyroidism, you're more likely to have inflammation and vice versa. If you have inflammation, that's a significant cause of hypothyroidism. So treating the source of inflammation, again, that's one of the most important things we can do. Interconnections, we know obesity, thyroid function, autoimmunity, leptin, what we're saying here is you have low thyroid, you have an increased risk of adiposity, uh, increased leptin. Leptin in turn interferes with proper thyroid signaling from the hypothalamus, so it becomes this feed-forward loop in this vicious cycle. So here this study uh, author says, regulation of inflammasome-derived cytokines in obesity is an important step in controlling the trigger of thyroid autoimmunity. Can't say it any better. And what we're saying there is treating the inflammation can actually prevent or, or uh, you know, or as we say here, control the trigger of thyroid autoimmunity. So, um, so it's that inflammation that's really, really important. And proposing a causal link between thyroid hormone resistance and primary autoimmune. Thyroid hormone resistance, like insulin resistance, like serotonin resistance, it's an inflammatory derived issue. The more inflammation you have, the less binding of receptors you have in the brain and in the periphery. Really important concept. I hope people are still paying attention. Uh, this will be uh, archived at the NutriWest website, so you can listen to this again and again and again. I know I went over a lot of inf information today, a lot of inflammation as well, but we have uh, this to be archived so people can listen to it over and over and over again. I think it's one of the most important topics to really understand um, for current and future generations. Finding the source of inflammation we've already talked about, really important. So here, um, common recommendations for all thyroid tissue. This is just, uh, just treated in a functional medicine way, and this is kind of how I do it, uh, or I begin anyway. And treating the anti, you know, looking at inflammation, here's all the, the what I call the magnificent seven um, categories of treating uh, thyroid problems, you know, anti-inflammatories, combo products, detoxification, essential fatty acids, making sure your retinoids like vitamin A and vitamin D are there, and of course your gut support. So um, let's see, uh, additional thyroid support here, yeah, I mean, these are just kind of basic things that you want to do antioxidants, multivitamins, <clears throat> quick facts on vitamin D, uh, again, um, uh, here maternal serum vitamin D levels during pregnancy and offspring, neurocognitive development, here if you had levels of 30 nanograms per milliliter or less, you were more likely, the mothers were more likely to have developmental delay in neurocognitive development. So we want to make sure that it's well above 30 and most women tested during pregnancy are well below 30. Uh, I gave the statistic earlier that about 80% of women are below 30 during pregnancy, so really important. So, And again, vitamin D helps with insulin resistance, which is important during pregnancy as we've established. Optimal long-term levels, uh, in this study anyway, we're talking long-term levels of vitamin D, that's 36 to 40 nanograms per milliliter. Doesn't mean that you can't go up to 80 or 100 short-term, but long term, you want to be, I believe, more around 40 uh, or, or maybe 50. But here, too high levels can also cause problems long term. So just I just wanted to throw that in there because so many people are saying that you just need to stay at 80 to 100 indefinitely, and I do not agree with that. It's okay short term, but it's not necessary long term. Okay, Zinc is important as well for the developing brain, so making sure the, the zinc is important here. And if you have a zinc deficiency, it actually was ameliorated by NAC and, lipo and alpha lipoic acid. So that's why another reason why it's important to have these antioxidants as well as the nutrients. So 
enzymes to increase. So these are the kind of the categories that you want to think about for your, your pregnant population. Reverse insulin resistance before pregnancy. Deal with the inflammation. Uh, that just kind of got down here. Deal with inflammation before pregnancy. Ensure adequate vitamin D. Um, obviously, things to make sure that you're uh, increasing blood flow and adequate blood flow to the fetus. Magnesium also is very important. So the, in here, magnesium supplementation reduced intrauterine growth restriction. So that's really important. Glutamine can also be in, important in not only supporting the gut, but also reducing the NF kappa B activation. So get uh, making you know glutamine can be very important. Basic preconception solutions, again, it's not much different than treating any of your other patients. Filtered water, organic foods, no GMOs, organic cleaners, pesticide, no pesticides. Uh, of course, the landmark study about organic foods was done four or five years ago where they took children and they compared children who had 75% of their diet organically and then they compared them to children with 75% non-organic or greater and what they found was almost a 12-fold increase in pesticide residue in the blood of children who did not eat organically. So, so is organic important? Yeah, absolutely, especially for pregnant women and, and breastfeeding women and males too who are, who are getting pregnant because those pesticides and pollutants cross or go right into the, into the sperm as well. Here's what I do for laboratory evaluations, I do my comprehensive blood panel. Uh, you can call professional co-op and get signed up with professional co-op if you want, and you can ask them for my panels. I've developed a few panels with professional co-op, so you can see what I run. I run my, it's, I have a standard and a deluxe, and I, all new patients uh, get the deluxe panel with uh, antibodies, with homocysteine, with CRP, with hemoglobin A1C, all of these, and you get a, a, a good discount if you if you order it as a panel. If you get in trouble or, or have any other questions, you can call in too as well. Um, she'll, she'll get you started if you're new to blood interpretation. Uh, she has a great uh, program as well to help you interpret uh, the, the laboratory um, results. I do methylation SNPs through doctor's data and the methylation profile as well through doctor's data. It tests for levels not only for your SNPs, but also how those SNPs are being expressed. So what are the levels of SAMe? What are the levels of homocysteine and s adenosyl homocysteine? What are those levels so that you can see exactly what needs supported? I don't believe in just running SNP tests and giving people nutrients just based on their SNP test because there's a difference between having a SNP and expressing a SNP and there's many different levels of expression of, of SNPs. So, so running the methylation profile is really important. Heavy metals, pre and post challenge if you're not pregnant. Hepatic detox profile, again, through doctor's data, how do you want to support phase one, phase two? Are there glutathione levels where they should be? I do the comprehensive stool and parasit uh, parasitology for infection and inflammation. Again, I use doctor's data, but you can use many different um, there's, you know, companies out there. Salivary hormones are uh, also important for not just fertility, but for fetal development. Organic acids, I use Great Plains for that. Food allergies and micronutrient analysis. These are things that you want to treat. Uh, a potentially, you know, pregnant women, you want to get them as healthy as possible so that the fetus can develop without uh, serious developmental problems. And we can have future generations. And we're not going to have, we don't have to have uh, sicker and sicker and sicker, um, uh, you know, children being born. This is uh, comprehensive nutrition. This is kind of what I think most people should be on, whether they, they're planning on getting pregnant or not, but your multivitamin, your mineral, your methylation support, your anti-inflammatories, vitamin D, the complete omegas, probiotics, iron support, definitely. I make sure that I do iron with vitamin C because vitamin C increases iron absorption. So if you do Hemolife, I'll also do some vitamin C like Sago C with it. Thyroid and iodine support if needed, probably will, because most women do have thyroid problems. 
Um, total alpha lipoic acid, CoQ10, the NAC is really, really important. Um, NutriWest has, will have a new product coming out in just a couple weeks called NAC Renew. So, um, so that's going to be really important if you want to just increase NAC levels. Complete glutathione, core level, ovary for fertility, those can be really important. And the, the NutriWest has a detox protocol. Call your distributor, ask for the protocol, but make sure you do that at least you're finished with it at least three months before they plan on getting pregnant. So make sure that they are, they are practicing good, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the good uh, uh, ways to avoid getting pregnancy uh, or getting pregnant while they're doing detox. You don't want to be in the middle of a detox, go, oops, I got pregnant. So, um, so make sure that they're, they're really practicing uh, safe sex there. And uh, again, this webinar is meant to just introduce you to the research. If you want more in depth, uh, we did go pretty in depth, but if you want more in depth, again, the original internist, December 14th issue, which is just coming out here, go to Clint Publications. It's a, it's a good uh, journal, original internist. Our Stolen Future, uh, that's required reading for every single patient of mine that is thinking about getting pregnant. Our Stolen Future by Theo Colburn and Nutrition and Development, Short and Long-Term Consequences for Health, the British Nutrition Foundation, also very good. This one's a little, Our Stolen Future is more for the layperson, Nutrition and Development is more for, you know, the practicing physician. So uh, these are just my online courses that I'm going to put. I have uh, a whole 100-hour functional medicine course going into everything, blood chemistry, gastroenterology, gut, brain, immune, uh, hormones, both male, female, thyroid, adrenals, and, you know, organic acids and pollutants and things. So um, look for that. If you are interested in that, you can contact me at harmonyhealingcenterpc at comcast.net, and we can tell you uh, where to go to access the online portion once it's ready. As of now, J December 2014, and it's still in development, but it should be should be coming fairly soon. And of course, the Brain Symposium that I talked about, January 16th to the 18th in Arizona. Uh, go ahead and call call this number or email this um, uh, email here and they'll get you set up if you want to go. We'll go more into a lot of different speakers uh, lined up for, for this Brain Health Symposium, so I'm pretty excited about that. So well, I don't know how many people are still out there paying attention, but thank you for uh, sticking with all of this. I know it's been a, I know it's a, it was a long webinar, but I wanted to get all this in because we're going to archive this, and you can listen to it over and over and over again. Contact your NutriWest distributor. They'll tell you how to get uh, get access to this. Give us a week or, or, or two to get this on the website, but it will be archived. And in the meantime, we can probably even send you a link if you need to so you can contact Lynn Tui for that information. And uh, uh, so, again, um, you know, I hope this was helpful, and, and and it has been in my practice. And not only is it important for treating people who are about to get pregnant, but understanding the mechanisms of how we develop uh, and and how health is is developed, or how even illness is developed, can give us important insights in how in bringing wisdom and in bringing these therapeutic interventions to um, those people who who need it so thank you all for paying attention and and hopefully we will see you in the future thank you have a re good rest of your day wherever you are